So I wanted to uh, explain a little bit about uh, what we did in class today. I know that um, there, there's a lot of moving parts. So um, the students had asked me to make a video of this. So this is my attempt to capture not only what we did in class today, but also just to capture um, our discussion of k-means and RFM models. So this is data the way it would sort of come out of a maybe a transaction processing system or some uh, some type of uh, point of sale system. And I wanna show you one way of turning this into a pretty simple RFM model. It's important to say that there are many ways to do this, and I'm not sure that this is really a typical way to do this, but this will give you the idea of what an RFM model can do. It is also designed to show you how very often we have to transform our data to be able to do something sensible with it. So I'm gonna do this from start to finish, um, including all kinds of ways to transform these data. And um, this is probably not the ideal way to do it, but it is designed to help you understand the types of things you might do if you wanted to process this kind of data. So the first thing that we need to do is to uh, get this into a format where we can uh, evaluate the total uh, for each of these different, um, basically for, for each of these uh, different customers, right? So we've got our customer ID there and we have a quantity and a unit price. So the first thing that I'll want to do is to um, basically make a total price here that multiplies the quantity by the unit price. Right? So uh, in order to know how much uh, somebody actually spent, we need to perform this calculation and this will uh, help us get that done. So that's sort of the first thing that we um, would need to do. I'm gonna remove some data that we really don't need. We might use these data for some other things. So um, for example, we talked about market basket analysis. We might actually use the stock codes and the descriptions for market basket analysis, but we're not gonna use them here. So I'm just gonna remove them to make this um, a little bit easier to work with. And we also are not going to do any analysis by country today, maybe someday, but but not today. So these are really the um, the the items that we need. And the first thing that we need to do is to get our data into some recency, frequency, and monetary value that makes sense. Because the way it's currently formed, we really don't have a great way to do that. So what we're going to do is use a pivot table to make that happen. So I'm gonna take uh, the our current sort of uh, working data and I'm going to basically add, a, add this to a pivot table. And when I add this to the pivot table, I'm going to add it to the data model. Now, if you're on a Mac, you won't have this option. And I looked it up as of, Pretty recently, uh, there is no such option on a Mac for this. So I'm sorry, that's not one that I can fix for you. This isn't something, this part of the analysis isn't something that I would really ask you to do. Um, so I'll tell you when this becomes Mac friendly again. Uh, it's actually pretty soon, but um, just to keep in mind that it's a known thing, Macs don't do this part. So we say, okay, and it's gonna take a little time to sort of build this for us, but now we've got our um, now we've got our pivot table. So in the pivot table, we'll want to put our customers in rows, and I'm going to just um, you know sort this so that it's a little easy to read and be sort of organized. And um, let's start with the R part. So we have the invoice date. And it's going to initially try to count it. For R, what we really want is we want their most recent purchase date. So instead of counting this, what we really want is the max, right? So the max would be the most recent date that they had a purchase. And so you can see this is historical data. 
but that max um, should give us, you know, the most recent date. So it looks like this customer purchased something on uh, January 18th, 2011. To prove this to yourself, um, let's make sure that if we set this to min, this is an older date. And um, it looks like the second customer, you can really see there's lots more 2010s here. Um, so that's kind of important for us. So we, we want to make sure that if we switch this back to the max, right, um, we can see that we're getting the most recent data. And you can see all the 2010s basically drop out of, of this view. So we're going to start by taking the max here. Uh, the next thing that we'll want is we'll want to get a um, account of the invoices, right? So we have the most recent, that's going to be our R. The F is going to be a count of our invoices. But because of the way these data are, um, it's actually returning the count of invoice number per item on that invoice. So these numbers are a little bit higher than we probably want them to be. So in order to fix that, um, we're going to summarize values by distinct count, meaning it's only going to count each invoice once. So when we change that, you can see that drops these uh, fairly, you know, quite a bit. That is actually the only part that you can't do on a Mac. On a Mac, you would just leave it the way it is. And, you know, we would just deal with it that way, right? Um, there's probably another way for us to do this without the pivot table, or there's probably fancier ways to get this done. But uh, this is sort of the simplest way. And really, for our purposes, it's just about understanding how you might change these data. And then uh, finally, the easy one really is, uh, so we have our R, we have our F, and the easy one is really the M, which is our total price. And that gets us a sum. So this is what our data looks like. And um, we probably want to do a couple of things to make sure that um, when we pull this out, it looks okay. So we want to make sure that, like, we don't know what blank means here, right? So these are like pretty big numbers and I'm going to exclude blank and I don't want to pull in the grand totals because that'll you know, draw my numbers off. I just want to deal with single customers that I can identify and their behaviors. So I'm going to take all of this data and I'm going to copy it. I'm going to make a new sheet and I'm just going to paste as values, right? So I can just get in here and figure out what I want to do. And I'm going to change these so that this sort of uh, makes sense. So this is going to be my, uh, that's my customer. Uh, this is my uh, recency. This is my frequency. And this is my monetary value. So we're just going to keep this nice and tight. Keep these really simple. And one thing that people find a little bit weird is the, the, like it upsets them that this doesn't look like a date. Um, this is actually how Excel stores a date internally. We can make it look like a date by just changing the formatting. So if we do that now, it looks like a date. So we know we can sort of format our way out of these problems. What I want to do is insert, because I, I kind of want to create a new version of recency based on these data. So at this point, I want to put in what today's date is, which we can get with the now function. And once I have this, I can sort of go in and you can see this is old data, so we don't really have to worry about it. And all I'm going to do is take the difference between those two dates, which just makes this kind of convenient, nice. And you'll see that it'll cast it in terms of a date at first, because that's just what Excel does. But we can quickly just tell it that it's a number. And what this number means is, and I'm not going to include the decimal places because we don't really care. Um, what this number means is that is the number of days 
between the person's last purchase and today, right? So that gives us a more usable version of our R metric. I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste as values over the original R because we don't need it in that format. And then uh, once I have that down and once it's in my, break, uh, once it, once, let me try that again. Gonna copy these. Right? So once you get it all sorted out, uh, I had to do a couple of steps to just retrace and catch up. Once you get it all sorted out, this is what your model should look like, right? The recency is telling us the number of days since uh, their last purchase. And that fractional number is really just like the time which we're basically gonna ignore. It's not really relevant to us. The F is the total number of times that they've purchased uh, over the course, so like how frequently they've purchased. And then uh, the M is uh, the monetary value of this customer over this period of time. So like I said, there's other ways to conceive of these data, but for our purposes, this is really just fine. Um, from here, what we want to do is get a sense of what this data looks like. Um, so, you know, the, the typical way to do this, the easiest way to do this really is to use um, a box and whisker just to sort of take a look at what this looks like. And I think when you take a look at it, you realize what the problem is really quickly, that the monetary value is just at a completely different scale. And you can see this in the numbers that, you know, the monetary value is just a huge value, um, just up to, you know, what looks like $250,000 or more. And really the frequency is really, you know, looks like just at scanning the data, it's like less than 20. So when we run a K-means cluster on this kind of data, it's really gonna be very misleading because it's really only going to take into account the differences in the monetary value. So we need to do something to figure out how to get all of these things into the same scale. So that's sort of the, the, the primary problem that if we run the K-means on the data as it is, we really won't get anything. We might get something useful, but it'll be based almost entirely on the monetary value. So what we wanna do is actually transform these data and this is where we can do this with z-scores, right? So if we take this, what we can do is just sort of capture, we're gonna put in the mean and the sample standard deviation for each of these metrics. And then we're gonna use those to transform these data into um, into z scores, and then we can cluster the z scores, and then you know figure out what the values are from the z scores. So this should help us at least get things into sort of a comparable scale as best as we can. There's probably other ways to do it, but this should give you a sense of why we might do this. So first, we're going to start with r. We're going to take the average of that. And uh, I'm just going to sort of see what that looks like. And I'm going to lock the rows, but not lock the columns so that we can sort of pull that across. We're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do this with the standard deviation here. And we lock what we need to lock here. And uh, if I've done my locking correctly, I should be able to pull these over and get reasonably good measurements. And I sort of set this up before, so this looks pretty good to me. And we can always check our values by looking at this and looking at this. There's some other ways I could have done this. I could have named these columns, of course, which might have been a little easier, but for now, this is fine. Uh, I'm gonna take my entire customer column and just paste it here so we can 
see what that looks like. And then I'm going to take my headings and put them there. And now we're ready just to turn these into Z scores. So we want to take our R value, subtract the arithmetic mean for R. We're going to lock this row. And then we're going to divide that by the standard deviation of the standard deviation of recency. So that should get us uh, something that's in the Z reasonable Z score. And you can see like these numbers get, you know, shrunk way, way down. Right. And all this is doing is resetting the mean to zero and uh, establishing basically setting normalizing everything by the standard deviation. When we pull this over, if I've done everything correctly, it should automatically adjust properly. And we can ride that down. I usually check just a couple to make sure I didn't uh, mess anything up. And finally, we do this for monetary value. So this isn't perfect, but the reason that we did all this is if I take this and now repeat my box and whisker plot, I get something that is a uh, much better scaled, right? So I can take a look at this and you can see that everything is sort of um, at least somewhat comparable, right? So I'll just call this RFM model. a uh, box and whisker and probably put in a legend just to make this a little easier to read and that's probably okay right so it's still not perfect but at least we have everything within a you know one order of magnitude and it's a little easier to compare these numbers than it is the, the sort of wildly differing numbers so that's uh, not so bad in my case, I'm just going to delete this because I don't really need it, but I wanted you to see how that, that could work. Now we're actually ready to cluster. I mean, we're ready to sort of do what we need to do. So um, I know that I'm going to make this with uh, three clusters. So I'm going to need three distance, three distance metrics, and we're going to need them in, and we're going to need to assign each of these to a cluster. And I'll have uh, centroid one, centroid two, and centroid three. And I'll copy over my RFMs here. And I'll leave a count because we might want to know how many are in each of these. We'll also need a place for an objective. And this is all stuff that you've seen. So this is really um, not too uh, difficult. I'm just going to put some reasonable values uh, for starting points here. Um, it actually probably doesn't matter exactly where we start these from, but you get the point. And now we're going to need to take the distance between each of these points and what it's, um, what it's, you know, centroid, comparable centroid is. So from here, uh, if we do the Euclidean distance, it's gonna be the square root of the squared differences between these two. And I'm gonna lock all this up because it could get very, very confusing if we don't uh, handle this correctly. And then we add that to the squared difference here. And then we add that to the square difference here. So there's a, quite a bit of stuff, but if I've done everything correctly, that should get us our distance. And I'm gonna build them across first uh, to make sure that they all sort of look right and then I'll copy them all down. When I pull this over, oh, I made one mistake. I probably really should lock the columns here. It'll probably make my life a little easier. And 
And then I'll, when I pull these over, it should reproduce the number exactly because it's still looking at the, making the same comparison. So for centroid two, we'll go down one. And for centroid three, we'll go down to row four. And uh, then I feel like we're probably in a place where we can drop these down. And then usually what I would do is just, you know, double check to make sure I'm comparing the right thing to the right thing in a few different places. So here and here and here. All right, so that looks like we're um, doing pretty well. We're comparing the right things across all of the different areas. So I'm gonna let that be what that is. Then we need to take the minimum of those three distances. And then finally, we uh, do a match to find out which uh, value which is our closest centroid, because we're finding the minimum. And when that's all said and done, that's what our assignments look like. The last thing we have to do before we run the solver is we need to take the sum of the minimum distances. This is gonna give us our, um, basically our sort of goodness of fit measure. And uh, now we're in a pretty good place to run the solver. So once we get to the solver piece, we go to data, run the solver. And what we want to do is minimize our objective function. We want to do that by changing our centroids. We want to run this as evolutionary and Basically, I'm going to keep it between uh, three standard deviations of the mean. So um, what I want to do is basically say that, um, well, actually, let me, before I sort of run off and do that, let me uh, stop and actually ask that question. I mean, we probably now want to find the mean or the sort of characteristics of this data that might help us. So we probably want to find a min and a max. Right? And this time we're not going to do it in the original data. We want to get a sense of what the min and the max are of this transformed data. So uh, we probably want to take a look and see what this looks like. So what I'm going to do is uh, find the min in our transformed data here. and pull that across right, just to see where the lower boundaries will be right so that's actually pretty tight um then the second one we want to find the max and i think this is where we're going to see some behavior that's going to make me think twice about just setting this three standard deviations around so the first two are probably going to look well, well even f is is you know pretty far out there so um, it looks like I've got to be careful with um, how this is working, right? I got to make sure that I'm doing the right thing here. So the max on some of these is actually quite far. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that our boundaries, our constraints stay within these boundaries. And I'm going to come up with three separate ones, right? So because these ranges are quite far apart, um, I want to sort of compensate for those in the constraints. So I'm going to let solver be like run a little bit further with these. So let's let's do solver again. I want to keep this here so we can see everything. I want to minimize the value of the objective. I want to do that by changing the values that are here. And I want different constraints uh, for each of these values, right? So um, for the cells related to R, 
I want them to be less than this I'll call three. And for those same, I want them to be greater than um, negative one, right? So we, we wanna keep that in a pretty tight uh, focus. For F, it's a little bit different, right? So for F, we want it to be less than, we'll call it 26. And uh, we want it to be uh, greater than, right, greater than negative one. And then, uh, so for the last one, for M, we want it to be less than, we'll call it 33. And we want it to be uh, greater than negative one. And I probably could tune these a little bit more, but this keeps it from searching an infinite space. Right? We double check our work to make sure that this is gonna do what we want it to do. Uh, we could probably fine tune these uh, values, but this is probably enough for us just to get through this example. So I think it's gonna be okay. I'm gonna click solve. And uh, it's going to take a little while to set up the problem. You can see down in the lower corner, it's going to keep trying to make that objective as low as it can make it. So you can see that the best current answer is 4,336. And it's just going to keep driving that down. So it's changing the value of the R, the F, and the M uh, until it can find some smallest the uh, smallest distance between each of these points and the available centroids. So we're going to sort of let this do its thing. I'm going to pause because this could be a while. I will tune back in when we are uh, back on. So you can see that it actually um, completed its, uh, its report. So we can just go ahead and say, OK. Um, and let's just take a look and see what it did, right? So it reduced our objective all the way down to 2,800 and change. So, uh, you know, it's it's got those across. We might, at this point, decide to do a couple of things, right? So I might decide to do something like um, I would want to, for example, count how many were in each group. So we can do count ifs on this sort of, uh, this column right here. And uh, I just wanna, in this column, count all the ones, right? And uh, I can just lock these so I can pull them down. And then all we need to do is change this last value to two and change this last value to a three. And uh, you can see we've got some pretty unbalanced clusters. So that's like interesting in and of itself. But then, um, you know, we probably also want to recast these centroids back into their original sort of uh, form so we can get a sense of like what these data are in the real terms. And so the way that we can do that is by basically um, multiplying each of these values by the standard deviation and then um, adding it to the uh, arithmetic mean. So like for the way that this would work here would be something like this, right? I would take, um, this is gonna be equals. I would take this value and multiply it by the standard deviation. And then I would probably do something like this. I would probably take the sum of that multiplication and add it there. And let's see what that looks like. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit, but so that would be four seven uh four seven zero four, which is you know if you think of our mean as being four five five one, and this is one point five standard deviations 
above that. So like if we add 150 to 4,500, we're about there. So that seems to be about right. Uh, the only thing I need to do to adjust this is to make sure that these are locked, right? So I don't want uh, these to change at all because those are going to be the same. Those references are going to be the same no matter where I pull this. And then I should be able to pull this down and get a sense of how these are different. So in terms of recency, right, um, our like most recent, would be the smallest number here. So that would be group three, right? They are they are the most recent group. Um, and we that's, you know, on average, that group has, uh, it's been 4,497 days since they've purchased, right? So they're, um, they're our most recent group. If we did the same thing with um, F, right? We can uh, sort of, you know, reconstruct all of these numbers in their original format. So, F would look like this. We're going to take this and we're going to multiply this by the standard deviation. And then we are going to sum that with the mean. And so we can, oh, I didn't lock something. So I've got to remember to lock stuff. And so when we pull these down, assuming I did everything correctly, uh, we can see that we've got some really, really different values here. And so this makes me jump out. This sort of makes me sort of jump ahead here because this looks pretty wrong to me. Um, so I have to think about if I got the math wrong here. 90 is a really, really far value. So I have to think about what that actually means. Maybe we got something wrong in our uh, data or maybe like, you know, that looks really, really wrong to me. And I want to sort of go back and see if there is an F that's like 90 like that. I mean, I don't really know. We'll have to go and take a look. There's 26. Like I didn't see any that were sort of that far out, but you know, maybe I missed something. So we'll have to take a look. I'll do like the way that we would check this would be to go get the max of these things, right? So we probably want the min and max of the original data. Just to double check, like this is the kind of thing that you would do. And the max is what I really care about here. So if I take the max of recency it's just bounds checking is really useful here and then we can just pull the max across and see what it is oh i'm wrong so um for f it's 248 so it's not that crazy um these would be people who are really big shoppers and that might explain why there's a, a, such a small number right so i have a feeling this might be our group of really, really big shoppers, because you can see this is also looking uh, quite, um, you know, quite, quite big. So then the last thing that we need to do is our M. And, you know, same thing, we're going to take the value of M here, we're going to multiply it by the standard deviation. Uh, I'm just going to lock these so we don't do anything silly. And then we divide that, I mean, pardon me, we uh, sum that with our mean so that we can reconstruct the original value. And that should be that. So when I pull these down, if I've done everything correctly, that should look pretty good. And I think we're now sort of cooking with grease. So if we take a look at our, our largest cluster, right? Our largest cluster has 3,244 people in it. They are the people who shopped the most recently. Um, they're not that frequent, 
but they do spend, a, you know, like that's not terrible, right? So that's, you know, their their sort of average spend is over a thousand dollars for this period. So that's not crazy, but you can see like, these are the people, right? That are our big spenders, right? So over this period of time, they're spending $53,000 on average. Their frequency is well above anybody else. And although they're not the most recent, they're pretty recent. Um, so that's pretty good. I think the people that we would be the most concerned about, right? So if these 26 people are our big spenders and these people are, you know, pretty recent, not too frequent and not too much money, these are the folks that we would be really worried about, right? Because these are the folks who are, they've, their recency is the, the, the furthest away. Their uh, frequency is the lowest. They only have, They've only, on average, been in the shop two times, and uh, they've only spent a total of $535. So this first group of 1,000 people, those are folks we are at danger of probably really losing. So if we're trying to find, you know, our customers who are, you know, really seem to be struggling, uh, this is, you know, that there might be in that group. And that's huge. It's a lot of people. So we have to decide if we need more clusters. We have to decide if there's other things we need to do, but that uh, can certainly help. And then, you know, we'll keep in mind that these 26 folks, those are really our big spenders, right? So um, those are the people that we probably, you know, want to figure out how to get them to be, you know, well, they're, they're, I mean, they're really super engaged. They spend a lot of money. Their frequency is super high. And, um, you know, they've been to the shop relatively recently, especially compared to group one. So those 26 customers are really super engaged. So, you know, we can find them and see what they're like. So I think that's probably enough. Like this is the essence of what we would do to make this, uh, this work. And um, I know it's a long example, but I hope that you find it helpful.